Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming along. I guess this talk's been inspired by the drone magnetics that we're getting through our front door. Um, some of it is some of it's quite good and some of it is not so good. Um, you know, a lot of the surveys that we get have not perhaps been planned that well. They haven't been the data hasn't been QAQC'd. Uh, the processing can be poor or, or non-existent. And so I guess I, we wanted to take the opportunity to come and talk to you guys about um, you know, where Drone Mag is at, a bit of a snapshot on where that community is and what can be done to improve it and what can be done to improve the product that, that you guys get and pay for. Um, you know, a quick history on Airborne Mag. The, the first survey ever was attempted in 1910 in the US, and that was uh, they put a balance beam in a hot air balloon and flew that. Uh, and that didn't work very well, which probably set the scene for um, blimps and mag data for the next hundred years, actually. <laughs> the, I guess the, the real step forward came in the during the Second World War when they got their census happening. And in 1944, the first uh, airborne magnetic survey was flown for exploration in the USA. Um, in 1951, we had our first one here. It was probably the late 50s when they started figuring out diurnal corrections and tie line levelling. Um, there was a lot of talk during that time. From there, the next big step forward was the 1970s when we got digital data acquisition. That, and that meant that you could do things, a lot more processing. And it was the late 70s that you started to see one and two VD vertical derivatives become standard. Uh, then in the 1980s, image processing started to ramp up. That came to us through satellite data. And then from there, in the early 90s was when we got real-time GPS navigation. And that was a huge jump forward in data accuracy and a reduction in the amount of work that was required just to locate the data. Before that was all done with photos and it was a huge amount of work. But I think it was probably the mid 90s when they turned off the GPS scrambling and because um, they figured that we'd all knew how to get around it anyway, so there was no point. During the 90s, desktop computers became pretty common, and that was sort of when everybody was able to bring these mag images and compare it to the, all the rest of their data really easily, and you could easily recalculate images and derivatives. It just became commonplace um, for everybody to be doing that. Yeah, man. And you know, in 2020, you know, drones arrived on the scene. Um, so just a quick snapshot of where that is. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot more mag being collected with drones nowadays, and that is increasing. There are advantages and disadvantages to that, and we'll go over some of those things through the talk. I guess early on, there are a lot of drone operators out there that really had no experience at all in collecting mag data, and that was certainly reflected in some of the results that we were coming our way. A lot of the surveys were poorly planned, um, clearly by crew that didn't have a lot of experience, weren't really aware of what was realistic. Uh, we'll go through some of those data problems and the noise issues that we had. Mag compensation, which is where you try and correct for the way that you're flying. Generally, a lot of the surveys that come through our door, they don't come with a survey contract agreement um, at all. And that leaves you really open to, you know, noisy data, um, things that are just not up to scratch. 
things that you would never accept from a normal airborne mag survey. Um, but I can say the quality is improving and it's improving really quickly from some contractors and less so from others. There is no standard mag drone survey. All of the contractors use something different. Um, they've all got their own way of doing it. Probably all I would really offer on that is that these systems with the uh, sensor attached firmly to the drone, I'm yet to see any good data from one of those. I would be really happy to be proven wrong and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that will happen one day, but so far, we haven't really seen it. So most of it, most of the time it's towed bird systems to get away from the drone and the noise that they create. The advantages of drones, you know, they can go to areas that perhaps a conventional platform can't or can't do easily, or it's just not practical. You know, in Australia, we're pretty spoiled. We can get a plane anywhere and everywhere generally, um, don't have to wait too long. There's a lot of parts of the world where that is just not true. Um, a lot of Europe, you, you, if you can get a plane there, it's gonna cost you more than 50 grand just to get them in the country. So drones are easily transported. You know, you can pack them up in a Pelican case, stick the guys on the plane and, and off you go. So it's a much simpler proposition. Uh, really good for doing small areas. You know, one K square, even in Australia, a survey that size, it's probably going to cost you more in MOVE than to actually fly the survey. So getting a drone on the scene makes a lot of sense. Yeah, isolated regions, um, Europe, parts of South America or even, um, it's just easier to get a drone in there. Areas of highly variable topography, it can be really hard to drape even with a helicopter sometimes. The much cheaper standby rates. I can tell you now that nobody likes hearing the words helicopter and standby in the same sentence. That's a good way of blowing your budget really quickly. There are a few disadvantages to drones. Um, we talked about magnetic compensation where a traditional plane would have to fly up to 120 metres to. And that's to find a, a uniform magnetic field um, where they can sort of go through a series of manoeuvres and figure out what their heading areas are, what their roll pitch or variation is. Uh, drones have a limited range. They have to stay within eyesight, although I think there's rumours of that changing in the near future as well. Um, the flying time is limited by battery duration and battery drones, as the voltage drops, you'll see a, a change in the noise. It's probably not a big deal, but you can often see it in, especially in your higher derivatives, TVDs, it just starts to change character a little bit. Um, the guys that are running petrol powered drones, obviously you don't see that. The flight path is always pre-programmed into a drone and so you need to have a, a good digital elevation model for that that's either got to come from a lidar survey or photogrammetry and what that will mean is they'll, they probably can't just fly around the big tree in the middle um, or you know the little mountain range they'll they sort of take an average i think that'll improve too with time but I guess that's an extra cost. You know, you need a LIDAR or photogrammetry. But probably they're just, those problems are um, just operational areas problems really. The, the biggest problem we have by far at the moment is inexperienced operators and data processes. So the surveys that are coming in, they're just, you know, these guys have a drone, what can I do with it? I'm going to stick a mag on it and I'm going to go and collect a survey. It's a bit like me saying, I've bought a truck. What can I do with it? I'm going to, I'm going to buy a jewellery and I'm going to stick it on the back. Got any drilling experience, Brent? 
No, but I'm driving a truck for 20 years. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the same thing and you, the results are perhaps not unexpected. We need to have a bit more of a think about survey design and execution, um, you know, line spacing and mean terrain clearance. As a general rule, the line spacing should equal flying height. Uh, the noise level of the system needs to be considered in the survey design. Um, a noisier system can't resolve the fine detail. That doesn't mean it's useless to you. You know, if you're in outback Africa and you've, all you've got is a noisy drone, you can still fly broader line spacing um, and it will be a lot better than what you started with. It's just about recognising the limitations of the system that you do have. Tie lines. Uh, all survey lines need to be intersected by two tie lines. And when a survey is split into segments, which it often has to be with drones to accommodate the size, those segments need to meet on a tie line. Um, and diurnal corrections using a base station. You know, they were talking about this stuff in the late 50s was when all of this got sorted out. So I think it's fair to say that they're well-established practices in the air mag game. And some of the, the inexperienced drone crew need to sort of catch up with some of this. And we need to start applying standard QAQC data protocols that you would expect from any other mag survey. You, you, you wouldn't let a fixed wing survey crew get away with some of these things. So we need to start tying down some of the drone guys on it too. Deliver data. You know, some of the early drone surveys that we get didn't look too different to this one. I suppose we should be thankful that the lines were at least flown straight. But, you know, they would have the, the ferry flights were included in it all, all the turnarounds, every reflight was in there. Some of the line spacing could be pretty irregular. Irregular line lengths, um, the data was rarely split into lines and there's no tie lines at all. So, because it didn't need tie lines, it's great straight, straight off the drone, apparently. So it's really hard to do anything with data like that. Um, most of them are getting better. This is what you'd expect to see, you know, trimmed lines, all the reef lights removed, unique line numbers, regular line spacing and tie lines. That is the standard of data that most of us have come to expect from any airborne contractor. And we've been, we've had that since probably the 60s, you know. Um, so it's not unfair to expect that from the drone guys. Beyond that, there is other raw data problems that are getting missed. Um, you get data dropouts where data is just missing from the line. Uh, location errors where the GPS just goes a bit kooky and um, throws data offline. Some unexpected line deviations, which maybe should have been picked up. Uh, altitude variations can make life a bit tricky. And I've even seen, seen whole surveys flown at the wrong height data. And there's a 20 metre difference between GRS 80 and AHD. And if you thought your survey was getting flown 15 metres off the deck and it was actually flown at 35, then it makes a big difference to the quality of data that you're getting. But even on a completed line, you know, you get little DC shifts. Um, or big spikes in the data. And all of this sort of stuff needs to be picked up in the field and either corrected or sorted out. It's, it's actually pretty unusual um, that those sorts of data problems get through to us. I hear a lot of talk about noise in mag data. And I guess it dictates the resolution that, of the magnetic information that you'll be able to get out of your data set. Drones all operate on electrical circuits, um, especially the battery ones. 
full of survey motors and GPS navigation and data acquisition systems. And all of that produces electrical noise, which is magnetic noise. And, and so do the traditional um, fixed wings and helicopters, they all suffer those same problems. And those guys work really hard to address those problems. You know, helicopters will tow the magnetic sensor 30 metres below the plane just to get away from it. Uh, we get heading variation and roll pitch yaw errors, and we'll look at that um, more in a minute. As, you know, what's an acceptable noise level and how are you going to measure it? And that should all be defined in your survey contract. Probably the most common way of measuring mag noise is with the eighth vertical difference. So the, the top image there is, is what you would get from a fixed wing data set. That's a very good one, I have to say. Um, but you know, they're 0 0.001 nanotesla. That's really low noise. And some of the early drone stuff we were getting was over 0.2. So you're two decades higher. Um, again, not necessarily a problem, but it's a limitation on what you can do with that system. You know, you, you probably don't want to be flying 20 metre line spacing with that amount of noise. But if you're flying 100 metre line spacing, it's fine, it'll work for you. Uh, but then it comes to what, what happens to that noise during the data processing. And really, your raw data should have the same amount of noise as your final process data. And if it doesn't, then where is that noise going? And if it's been removed, then it's been filtered. How is it being filtered? Um, so that, that's something that we would always check you know, whether or not that's been, there's been filtering during the process. I guess one way of looking at that, at your raw, look at your raw data and use a power spectrum. Again, I don't, this stuff is probably developed in the 70s and 80s, I suppose. And it just shows the frequency content of the raw data. And you can see at the beginning here, you've got what is more or less your geological content and then high frequencies, usually noise, um, but there will be some geological content in there. But then with drones, I started to see data like this. And it had been a long time since I'd seen a power spectrum like that. And it took me a couple of days to figure out where I'd seen it. And of course, back in the university days, um, we looked at data processing. And if you do a quick search on the internet, there's plenty of websites that look at high and low pass, band pass filtering. And um, you know, it puts this nice harmonic imprint onto the data. So that's not what I want to see in my raw data. Don't get me wrong, all, all mag data is filtered to some degree and it's all it's a process product, but it, it's when and how that happens that we need to know about. Uh, magnetic compensation, which deals with the direction of flight and the uh, roll pitch in your, that, that can be pretty significant. Um, and the, I guess the tighter your line spacing, the more significant that becomes. Uh, often it represents one of the largest noise sources in your data, so it, it's probably worth addressing. Um, those compensation coefficients, they need to be recalculated every time you go to a new area. Whenever you change something on a drone, it, it will always change uh, the signal of the drone. And there are some contractors that are working on this. They can't fly to 120 metres because that's illegal. Um, but they're, they're at least having a go. They're finding a way to, to overcome it. Others just ignore it, um, pretend that it's not there. We'll take care of it in processing somehow. Uh, and, and there's a lot that are not even aware that it's a problem. Um, it's a bit 
unfortunate. And this is what it would look like on a fixed wing. You can see, you know, as you fly in one direction, um, the, what is it? All right, so the blue one is the compensated, the red one is what they actually record. And you get your height, pitch and roll manoeuvres here. And in some directions that can incite a two nanotester anomaly. And I tell you, a lot of you guys are looking for anomalies smaller than that in your mag data. But it's not really that simple either, because when you fly in the other direction, it's a completely different amplitude. So you can't just to go one way and say, well, there you go. You have to go in all four directions, calculate it and remove it. it sort of processing has been done for a long time in fixed wing and helicopter stuff. It's tricky uh, for drones because they, they have to figure out how the sensor is rolling. Um, we'll get there, it's happening already. Uh, this is just a quick image to show what a, a two nanotesla no anomaly would look like. Um, you know, it's two nanotesla is a, a significant feature in your data. Micro leveling. Um, the final stage in mag processing is micro leveling. It's one of those sort of all powerful tools, but it's also a bit like sorting snowflakes with your bare hands. You know, you could get a needle and just flick them around a bit and be really delicate with it. Or you can just pick up handfuls of snow and smash it together and completely change um, what you're dealing with. And it's kind of the same with micro leveling. If you're going lightly and just sort out a few small issues, um, then that's great. But if you hit it really hard, to sort out some big problems. You can start inducing artifacts, you can start removing anomalies. So it's one of those things, you just have to be aware of what it's actually doing to your data. Uh, and an experienced data processor would, would be all over that. You know, they keep their eye on what's happening. This is just a quick image of, it's basically, a survey over um, identical areas, the same area. One is with a pretty noisy drone and the other contractor is doing a little bit better. The TMI image looks pretty similar. You know, you can see there's a bit, bit more noise in there, but you know, arguably pretty similar products. Um, and it's not until you get down into the 2VD, the high frequency stuff down the bottom, that you can really start to see the problems coming through. And we've highlighted an anomaly there that because of the noise in the first data set, we just don't see it anymore. All right, so we're gonna look at a, a data set now. This one, this one had a, a few issues. Um, the, there was probably more flying height variation in there than there should have been. Um, and that was attributed to a GPS problem. And some of the tie lines are not in great places either. You know, this area up here, they're just missing. These lines over here uh, have no tie lines at all. Um, some of these data sets, you know, there's a, a segment in there and it's not joined with tie lines. So that makes it really hard to process those data and make them all match up nicely. The reason that height variation is important is because the closer we get to the ground, the higher the amplitude of your mag anomalies becomes. So if you're 50 meters off the ground, you can, you can go plus or minus say 10 meters and it doesn't make too much difference. But once you get, start getting down to 20 metres and lower, the amplitude variation becomes a lot greater. And so you can imagine if you're trying to put together a nice grid, but you've, each 
each anomaly is a very different size because the drone was at a slightly different height, it starts to become really difficult to make that look neat and tidy. And you know, the lower we go, the more important this is going to become. I guess what I'm trying to show here is that we can make any mag image look fantastically smooth. No, that's not that hard. Um, I want someone to filter this, you know, pretty hard. It took him about five minutes. Um, and you know, you can see we've removed all of the noise and now we have a beautifully smooth image. Um, the problem with that is if you subtract those two grids, you can see what has been removed. There's all of the noise, but we've stripped out a lot of geology as well. Um, and that's it's not great. If you put those two images side by side, you'd be able to see a lot of subtle differences in there that had been stripped out. So having a perfectly smooth image is, is probably not always what you want. You know, you can live with a little bit of noise. What you can't live with is stripping out your geology. Um, raw data, you know, it's essential that we get raw data, real raw data to be able to reprocess it. And some of those drone contractors are reluctant to give you true raw data because it's, it's sort of secret stuff, you know, you might not understand. And if, but if we don't have it, we can't do anything to fix the problem. Um, and, and this is a, an example where, you know, the guys spent, you know, maybe a, a day trying to, you know, clip out the, the grotty data, trim some lines, you know, regrid it. And we were able to get a, a pretty good improvement on, um, on the final product. I think it's worked really well. Uh, this is a recent one from that Emerson Resources have let us show. It's from Tennant Creek. Uh, it's a really good data set. Um, 20 metre line spacing, uh, just over 25 metre mean flying height. You really can't see any line busts in there at all. Um, you can see a, the 2VD there on your right. You know, there's a little bit of noise in there, a little bit of chatter. But, but overall, that's actually holding together really well. So I, I think they'd be really happy with that. There's amazing detail in there. Um, that's you know, 20 metre line spacing, nearly 4K wide. So there's a lot of lines there. So you know, when I say things are improving really quickly, this is a good example of it, where it's starting to, to hold together. If you look at what's behind that though, the, the flying height across the whole area is reasonably uniform. You know, that's worked pretty well. And the, where all the lines sit, where all the, you know, it's all tire lined nicely. There's overlaps between all the different segments. It would have been a, an easy data set to process because all of the data is there and it just comes together. And this is what it could be like. It's nice. Uh, so yeah, in conclusion, um, when you're designing the survey, you need to acknowledge the limitations of the platform and the terrain. You know, um, maybe you can't get low because of the forest, so there's probably no point having really tight lines. We need to start attempting uh, some sort of mag compensation for flight direction, and, and that is already happening. Tire lines, you know, must be insect, every survey line must be in, intersected twice by a tie line and the segments need to join on a tie line and diurnal corrections for the from a base station. Now we established that in the 50s. I, th I think we can implement it still with drones. Uh, need to start checking our raw data for noise and filtering just to be aware of uh, what you're actually getting from them. Survey contract agreement. 
you, you would never do a fixed wing survey without a survey contract agreement. Um, and it, it dictates what you're willing to accept from the contractor. We need to start implementing that for every drone survey. Uh, and the good guys already are, you know, they they won't bat an eyelid on that one. Quality raw data um, from a well-planned and flown survey. Um, some of the processes might be a little bit inexperienced, but we can always salvage that. If we've got good raw data, it can be fixed. Um, and finally, you know, drone mag is just another mag survey, really. It's the same as a fixed wing survey or a ground survey. The, the, way it, the way you plan it and implement it, it really hasn't changed for a long time. And so we just need to see these, the, the drone surveys following you know, the industry protocol, I suppose, follow those fundamental principles. That's all I've got. Thank you.